Hi, Dave here from Informed American, talking with China expert and author of The Coming Collapse of China, Mr. Gordon Chang. Uh, Gordon, thank you so much for coming on and talking to me. Oh, thank you so much, Dave. Gordon, I've noticed over the past couple of months, or maybe even going back to the past couple of years, Americans have very much awakened to the idea that China is a threat, uh, both to the U.S. and to the into Asia and even the world. Uh, and President Trump uh, took a very hard line against China, instituting tariffs and a bunch of other measures. So I think people are maybe wondering now that we have a new president and President Biden, how has Biden's policies changed, if they have at all, compared to to President Trump's hard line? We have seen indications that President Biden will be tough, and we've seen indications that he'll go easy. You know, right now, the administration is in the midst of a China policy review. This is top to bottom. Uh, and also, um, you know, this meeting in Anchorage was also important in forming American views. So I think it'll take a little bit of time to see what the Biden policy really is. But I imagine, though, that it's we talk about a Biden policy or a Trump policy, but really America doesn't have a China policy. What we have are reactions to China. And so China's driving events. And so I think the Biden administration will end up looking like it has a tough policy, largely because Beijing will push it in directions that um, will force uh, the, the administration to do things. Do you expect to see more tariffs coming or rolled back or, or, or even or even I'll just pose it this way. Were the tariffs effective in any way? There was some criticism of their imposition. Well, the tariffs were imposed under Section 301 of the Trade Act of 1974 as a remedy for the theft of U.S. intellectual property. And China has been stealing, depending on who you talk to, somewhere between 150 to 600 billion dollars a year of U.S. IP. That hasn't stopped. So I think we can say that the tariffs were not effective because um, we, we, you know, this is a, a grievous loss that is continuing. What the tariffs have done have changed the relationship with China in a number of different ways. Um, so, for instance, um, we now have uh, the phase one trade deal that President Trump signed in January of last year. That's been really good for the farmers. Um, but it's also, uh, I think, to a certain extent, has changed trade patterns and has accelerated the decoupling. Um, what Biden will do, we don't know. He's going to keep the tariffs in place for the meantime, because as administration officials have said, they give the United States leverage. What we may see, Dave, though, is, um, you know, the, the administration giving tariff relief to certain um, groups that are individuals. And, and that could very well be sort of um, silent tariff relief. Interesting. Uh, I'd like to shift gears to Taiwan, if we could. I saw a disturbing report from the New York Post just a couple of days ago, a news coming out of the military. They've been wargaming uh, si si simulations in Taiwan, uh, either an invasion from China or simply an attack on, say, a U.S. carrier group. And the news, Gordon, is not good. Uh, military officials say anonymously saying that we basically, the U.S., as, as, as we, lose basically every time in a confrontation with China. Uh, uh, and it makes it kind of makes you wonder. I mean, is Taiwan going to go the way of Hong Kong? Is is it is it basically, is it going to be lost to China, Gordon? What do you make of this? I don't think Taiwan is going to be lost for a number of reasons. Um, you're referring to a war game for the U.S. Air Force, and they get creamed. Um, but this has really been true for more than a decade. Um, our war games show us losing each and every time. Um, but there's a number of things to put into this. First of all, um, the Chinese have not had a military engagement since 1979, when they sent their first string to Vietnam to teach the Vietnamese a lesson, as Deng Xiaoping, the Chinese leader at the time, said, well, the Vietnam's third string taught China a lesson, and it was an ignominious um, exercise for the Chinese. Um, I'm not sure that Xi Jinping is really that confident. Remember, for him to successfully invade Taiwan, he has to, first of all, be willing to accept enormous casualties. And that's not part of the Chinese narrative. There is no narrative of casualties. And, and also, um, the other thing is, he has to trust a commander with a substantial number of uh, Chinese forces. 
I'm not so sure that in the communist system that's really permitted. Remember, this is a communist military. It is politically controlled. It's got political officers are more important than line officers. That doesn't make for an effective military. Also, in a fight over Taiwan, it's not just Taiwan and the US versus China. There's gonna be other players involved because Japan knows that it is critically affected um, and really it'd be very difficult for Japan to defend itself if Taiwan were in China's hands. Also, you have North Korea getting involved on China's side. This could very well escalate into something which is not just regional, but global. So there's a lot that um, I'm sure that the war gamers haven't really put into play. And so therefore, um, we don't know how this would turn out. But the most important thing is that we've been able to continue to deter China. And I think we'll be able to do that, especially if we commit more resources into our military, which is what we have to do. I know Biden doesn't want to do it. Nobody wants to do it. Yeah. But right now, the Chinese threat is so um, frightening that I think that we are going to do it. Interesting. I want, I want to talk a little bit about cancel culture. This is something that's uh, been on the minds of our readers and viewers. They are not angry, or I'm sorry, they are a bit angry about the direction uh, our, our culture has taken in terms of the, the kind of cancellations and silencing of uh, what I, I guess you could almost call them dissidents, just <laughs> views outside uh, what, what has become the mainstream uh, or the dominant culture. Are there any lessons from China to be learned of what's going on here in the United States? China had cancel culture starting from the formation of the People's Republic establishment in 1949. Mao Zedong um, silenced everybody. And what resulted was a cancellation of everything, including Chinese culture. You ended up with the Cultural Revolution, but you also ended up with the Great Leap Forward and other disasters. And after it was all done um, in the Maoist era, tens of millions of Chinese died. At the low end, we're talking 30 million. At the top end, um, 70 million. We really don't know. Um, but the point is, cancel culture doesn't lead to anywhere good. The reason why um, democracies are so successful is because they're vibrant discussion. And um, canceling voices just never leads to good results. So I think China is really sort of the best example of what happens when cancel culture runs wild, as it inevitably does. It leads to excess, and we saw what happened in China. I think people have a hard time with what's going on here in the United States because it's not being imposed uh, from the government top down in that sense. So how do you make, how does, how is there a way to sort of break through that? I, I don't know the exact history of China before Mao came to power, what the, what the climate was there. Uh, but I, I think we're used to a 1984 scenario where it's the government doing it. And now that's not the case. So uh, how, how do we make sense of this? Well, part of it, it does come from the government. Um, on January 26, President Biden issued his executive order, um, which um, really just criticized in the most severe of terms, um, President Trump, it, you know, used the word xenophobic, said America was xenophobia. So this cancel culture, although, as you point out, a lot of it is not from government um, sources, it does have support in the Biden administration, um, as that executive order tells us or shows. Um, this, is, this is really serious, especially because, um, you know, as Bill Maher said, uh, we have become a silly people. Now, that's from Lawrence of Arabia talking about the Bedouins, um, but we've become a silly people. And he's right about that. And um, we have seen this, for instance, in all sorts of, of woke pronouncements, even from the Pentagon, which at least appears to be more serious about uh, woke matters than it does about uh, confronting China. So you can't put the Pentagon in a timeout on domestic matters and expect them to really focus on what is the common enemy. Well, then with that, uh, how hopeful can we be with uh, actions in the South China Sea, Gordon, if, uh, if the military is preoccupied with some other, all these other cultural issues? Well, this, this is in indeed a problem. But the, the issue, though, is that uh, China doesn't want to take on the United States um, because it realizes that uh, even if we're not um, fully effective, we are effective enough to um, impose enormous casualties on the Chinese. And I don't think they're willing to accept that. That would probably be the end of their political system, at least as they calculate it. Mm -hmm. And as I said, um, 
you, know, you don't have um, woke problems in India or Vietnam or Taiwan or Japan. And remember, this is going to be a, a fight with a lot of participants in it, not just a weakened United States. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to talk about dealing, doing business with Chinese companies. I'm thinking of Huawei and TikTok. What's the danger there in the uh, United States and European countries, European countries doing business with these kinds of Chinese companies? Yeah, Huawei and TikTok pose separate dangers. Um, with regard to Huawei, um, the danger is that China will use Huawei as it has in the past to um, exfiltrate information surreptitiously. They did that when they put Huawei servers into the headquarters of the Chinese donated and Chinese built headquarters of the African Union in Addis Ababa. They were downloading information surreptitiously through those Huawei servers for five years, from 2012 to 2017. That's why China is subsidizing Huawei um, throughout the world because it wants to take the world's data. Now, if you can take the world's data, you're increasing the capabilities of your artificial intelligence systems. Yep. Plus also you're giving China the capability or at least the potential capability to manipulate devices remotely, which means that in the internet of things, which is enabled by 5G, the fifth generation of wireless communications, um, they can unlock your front door. They can burn your toast. They can turn off your pacemaker. They can drive your car off the cliff. That's what we've got to be concerned about, because in the initial moments before a war, they could paralyze American critical infrastructure if we allowed Huawei equipment in. Now, the uh, FCC is busy getting Huawei equipment out of our networks, a good thing. But remember, we're connected to the rest of the world where there's a lot of Huawei equipment. With regard to TikTok, um, TikTok has been surveilling users, taking information, um, they've been doing all sorts of things which are not permitted in the United States. But the one thing that is really dangerous is that uh, Beijing is able to use TikTok to get Americans to do things that China wants. Radio Free Asia reported that an intelligence unit of the People's Liberation Army based themselves in the now closed Houston consulate. And there they were using big data and artificial intelligence to identify Americans likely to participate in Antifa and Black Lives Matter protests. And then China sent them videos, videos on how to riot. Now, that's more than just subversion, that's an act of war. TikTok has been used because TikTok has the world's most sophisticated, commercially available artificial intelligence. It can get people to do what it wants. It's extremely addictive for that reason. And that's why it's so commercially successful. But Beijing sees it not because it wants to send cat videos to Americans, <laughs> but because it wants to be able to get Americans to say and think what it wants. So that's why TikTok is dangerous. And just one other thing, Dave, China doesn't allow our apps into China. So why do we allow their apps into our society? This is an issue of reciprocity. So even if TikTok weren't guilty of a number of dangerous th things, including crimes, they, they just shouldn't be in our country. Uh, when you combine something like what you just described with TikTok, when you look at uh, fentanyl making its way into the United States, when you look at uh, basically, as you say, uneven uh, uh, relationships with companies, uh, it, people have been saying China has been at war with the United States for decades. Would you agree with that assessment? Um, yes, because China has changed the definition of war. It has this doctrine of unrestricted warfare. That comes from the title of that uh, notorious book from two Chinese Air Force colonels in 1999. And, and China views it this way. Um, in May 2019, China was even bold enough to come out and say it. Um, People's Daily, which is the most authoritative publication in China, carried a piece that declared a quote unquote, people's war on the United States. So they branded us an enemy. Um, I don't know what more we need, um, but they have been doing a number of things. Um, and you mentioned, you know, we can talk about China spreading disease or we can talk about predatory trade practices, stealing IP. There's a lot of it. But yeah. you, you did mention fentanyl. And the one thing that we should point out is that China's fentanyl gangs are large and well organized. They use the Chinese banking system. They use the Chinese postal system in a near total surveillance state. These gangs could not operate unless they had the blessing of the Communist Party. 
So when we talk about Chinese fentanyl coming into our country, it's because China wants it to come into our country. They could stop it in an instant if they wanted to. They don't want to. They kill 30,000 or so Americans every year because of fentanyl. And actually, we're seeing cocaine and amphetamine deaths increase because those substances are mixed with fentanyl these days. So that's warfare. And um, it's, it's very different than what we Americans think is warfare, mm -hmm. but China's conducting it nonetheless. I want to shift gears to something you wrote about recently that to me sounds like complete science fiction, which is China's genetic engineering, trying to create super intelligent super soldiers to infiltrate the United States. Am I being too sensational about this? How real is this? Well, unfortunately, this is real. Um, as director of national or then director of national intelligence, John Radcliffe wrote in his Wall Street Journal op-ed in early December, um, he mentioned that China is experimenting on uh, People's Liberation Army soldiers, conducting experiments to enhance their genetic capabilities. We know a couple things, though, apart from what Radcliffe said. So, for instance, um, the, uh, we know that the professor in Shenzhen, uh, Hu Jianghui, um, is the first and only researcher known to use CRISPR, the gene editing tool, Mm -hmm. to um, work on human embryos that produce live births. That happened in late 2018 with twin girls, the first uh, humans born genetically modified. Now, um, Professor Hu was talking about, oh, I, I did this. He removed the CCR5 gene. Um, and he said, I did this because I wanted to make the girls resistant to um, HIV. But he also did that from all indications to enhance their intelligence. Now, he's not the only Chinese researcher to fool around with human embryos, mm -hmm. um, but he's the one who has caught uh, the world's attention. And also, we've got to remember that the Chinese conduct all sorts of really strange experiments, mixing pig and monkey DNA. Also, there is a guy in Kunming at um, a state-run zoology institute who is actually put human genes into primates to increase their intelligence and to give them the ability to speak. So this is, um, this is weird science. It is science yeah. which is not permitted in other countries, including ours. Um, and it is extremely dangerous because in China, there's no restrictions, which means that geneticists around the world go to China because they can do what they want free of, of government restrictions and ethical uh, boundaries. So, um, yeah, we could end up with a bunch of superhuman Chinese. Wow, this is this is bizarre and goodness. As you, uh, I mean, the, the, the litany of things you've listed here, you just, uh, what can go wrong here? Well, I, 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 my mind can Oh, go yeah, wrong. what can go wrong? <laughs> Unbelievable. Uh, I want to talk about uh, going back to just mentioning your book here, The Coming Collapse of China. I know you, you wrote this uh, some years ago, but where are we now? How, how stable is the Chinese regime? Yeah. I mean, I was wrong in my prediction because in 2001, I wrote The Coming Collapse of China and I said the Communist Party would fall within 10 years. Um, so obviously I'm wrong, completely out of time. Um, the 2008 downturn really helped, I think, strengthen the Communist Party, but I was wrong. But right now, I think the regime, um, you know, looks frightening, looks like it's going to take over the world. I don't see it that way. I see it as exceedingly dangerous because they realize they've got a closing window of opportunity. That if they don't get what they want now, they're not going to get it. And, and they've got a lot of reasons why. Because they're, first of all, their economy just isn't that strong. It didn't grow 2.3% last year, as they reported. Um, it's not going to grow as fast as the Wall Street thinks it is. And, and largely because just a simple thing. No society in the world today is going to recover unless it has safe and effective vaccines. United States has three of them. China has none. It's got vaccines, three of them, but uh, they're barely effective and they have not been proven safe. China's not releasing data on that. So we're going to recover faster, I think, in the long run than China will. But there's, there's another overarching problem for China. And then let me just mention it quickly. Sure. And that is China's in the initial stages of the most dramatic demographic collapse in history in the absence of war and disease. China is now about 1.4 billion people. It has a total fertility rate, maybe even one 
0.0, maybe even less than one, maybe 1.1. But even if you were to apply a 1.2 total fertility rate, total fertility rate is the number of children per woman of childbearing age. 2.1 is replacement. One is certainly not. Yeah. But even if you were to apply 1.2 to China, which I don't think it can maintain, at the end of this century, the United States could very well be more populous than China. And if you were to apply China's current TFR, the real rate, the U.S. would be more people than China at 2100. So that really indicates that China has a closing window. They're, they got to do it soon. If they don't sue it soon, I think that they're going to find that they are out of time. And that's what's making China move very fast right now. Interesting. Gordon, final question before I, uh, before I release you. Uh, you mentioned earlier that the U.S. doesn't have a unified China strategy. It's very reactive. So now I'm going to put you in the seat and give you a chance to, to, to say what the U.S. Uh, unified strategy uh, in regard to China should be. What, what, what should that be? Yeah, and you're probably not going to like it. Um, okay. But right now, China is overwhelming the United States. FBI is overwhelmed, local law enforcement's overwhelmed, uh, our governments are overwhelmed, um, because China is exploiting every point of contact with us to try to overthrow our government, which means that until we can figure out how to manage the situation, we're going to have to cut our ties with China. And this is going to be painful. Um, I'm talking about trade, investment, diplomatic relations need to be scaled back. We need to work much more closely with our friends and allies, concentrate on them. Um, this is going to be painful for us. But if we want to get through a very difficult period in our history, maybe the most difficult, maybe the greatest challenge, we're going to have to do things that are inconceivable to us because it's going to become clear that China is on the march and they have uh, malicious intentions. They've got capabilities. They know that they've got to do this fast. And so we've got to react and do things to defend our society that we didn't think that we could do. Fantastic, Gordon. Thank you so much for coming on. Uh, everyone can check out Gordon's work at gordonchang.com. Uh, you can also follow him on Twitter. Tw uh, Gordon, you're very active on Twitter, so I encourage everyone to go to uh, at Gordon G. Chang there on Twitter. That's his handle, so go follow him uh, and then certainly check out his books and uh, all, of his, all of his articles. Gordon, thank you so much for taking time to talk to me. Well, thank you so much, Dave. I really appreciated it.